Hello, everyone, and thank you again, Flippa, for having me here today. Um, again, my name's Olivia Kim. I'm from Guidin Financial, and as Blake just mentioned, I've been with the company for five years, and really during that time, I've pretty much been living and breathing SBA loans, so I really do know a thing or two about how this all works. Um, now, a little bit about Guidin. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, we offer um, a various amount of products and services for our clients that are looking to buy a business for the first time, um, already own a business, and are even on the path to selling one. Um, so some of those services include putting together certified appraisals and helping um, clients find funding solutions through unsecured financing, portfolio loans, um, and even a unique one called 401k financing. Um, but all of those are heavyweight topics on its own, so today I'm going to be focusing on SBA loans. Um, although the majority of my clients are really buyers, getting an SBA loan to buy a business is a two-way street between the buyer and seller. Not only does the buyer have to look good and be qualified, so does the business, and that naturally involves the sellers. Um, so my talk path today, again, it's aimed a bit more towards the seller side of things to help everyone get a better understanding of what to expect if you have a buyer going this route and what you can also do to best you know, prep it moving forward. Um, when talking to people going through this route, you know, whether it be buyers or sellers, honestly, a lot of them will probably tell you that the SBA is a beast of its own. And I'd be lying if I said that wasn't true. Um, as qualified as a borrower and even a business might be, the, it's still going to feel like there are quite a bit of hoops to jump through. So to get everyone a bit more familiar with SBA loans, I first want to introduce what it actually is. So SBA loans are small business loans that are guaranteed by the Small Business Administration. Try saying that five times fast. Um, so with this being a government-backed loan product, there are certain commandments that all lenders have to follow. And we all know that you know, anything government-related, they love their rules and regulations. Um, I will say, with SBA loans, the majority of businesses funded with this product, they are brick and mortar, but um, the requirements for online businesses do not differ. Everything is going to be viewed, evaluated, and even scrutinized all in the same way. So let's get on to the rules. Um, for businesses purchased with SBA loan funds, all businesses must be US-based. Um, the loan range for SBA loans start as low as 25,000 and they're capped at 5 million. And the business cannot be passive. So what this pretty much means is, um, for example, a passive business is like you own an apartment complex or a salon suite. The reason that's viewed as passive is because as an owner of that business, the majority of your revenue is pretty much collecting rent from your tenants or maybe your hairstylist in the suite. There's normally not much more you do to generate more active income. Therefore, it's classified under passive and that's just not SBA qualified. Um, oops, there we go. Now moving on to more of the borrower side of things. Um, as a borrower slash buyer, you are required to bring in a minimum of 10% equity injection. So that pretty much means um, the best, well, the best way to think of equity injection is like a down payment. All buyers need to bring in some sort of cash of their own into this deal. Um, borrowers must be a US citizen or at least have a green card. And probably one of the most important ones is borrowers cannot have caused a loss to the government. So, for example, this means, um, let's say, there's a borrower that um, on their record shows that they have a charge-off on a government student loan, or a charge-off on a VA mortgage, or maybe they owe late taxes. All this will result in an automatic decline. Again, to emphasize, this is a government-backed loan product. So if lenders see that the borrower already has a history of causing loss to the government, um, I think it's a no-brainer. It's just a no-go from there. All right, so with all this being said, you know, again, this is just a few rules on an extensive list of, you know, what the SBA requires from borrowers and sellers. Um, to make matters more interesting and complex, 
Those rules and regulations don't necessarily stop there with what the SBA says. Um, there are some rules that lenders must follow verbatim, but there are some that are also going to be open to interpretation. And I guarantee you, every SBA lender out there will take those rules and make adjustments to that to have it meet um, their own bank's expectations and preferences. So the best example would be the one about equity injection, where it says 10% minimum. Now, I've had many buyers and even sellers say, Olivia, SBA says we only need to put in 10%. Why does this bank need more? Well, let's go back to the wording. Again, SBA says borrowers just need to bring in 10% minimum. That means the lender can't accept anything less, but we all know banks. They'll definitely accept more than the 10%. Um, so, from my personal experience, when it comes to business acquisitions, lenders usually say they want to see a 20% cash infusion from the borrower. This means whatever the sale price of your business is, the borrower needs to have 20% of that in cash, at least, to put into the deal. And this shows lenders that they, have, um, that they are committed and that there's some skin in the game. Now, there are some cases where lenders can accept less than 20% and maybe even go down to that 10, but it honestly happens very rarely. In my experience, um, lenders who do allow less than 20%, it's usually for um, borrowers that have very, very strong personal financial record and there's a strong business to match with it. This combination shows the lenders that the business, or I would say this overall transaction, has minimal risk, therefore the lender is more open to being flexible. All right, so now that we got through that dry technical stuff, let's move on to something you know most of the audience might be curious about. So for SBA loans, the focus is usually going to be on the buyers, but what do sellers really get out of it? So first, let's move on to the benefits. Borrowers that go through this SBA process, they do kind of have to go through rigorous steps to even be qualified for this loan. So on one hand, the seller knows that if the borrower is qualified, they're not wasting their time with unqualified buyers. And going through the SBA process is really not an easy ordeal. So the buyer is also showing that they're very committed to getting this done. Um, the initial application process uh, doesn't really require a lot of upfront work from the seller. Now, this doesn't mean that the seller is free and clear of providing any information to get things moving along, but, what it but it pretty much just means that although you have some information to provide, it's not to the same magnitude as the buyer. Any fees associated with SBA loans, that's really gonna be on the buyer to take care of. And then lastly, and probably one of the most important ones, if the buyer does get qualified and approved for the loan, the seller gets a nice paycheck up front. You get the wholesale price up front. So that's always a benefit there. Now, as I stated earlier, the SBA process, again, it's a two-way street between the buyer and seller. So although the buyer goes through um, a lot more, or does a lot more legwork with the bank up front, the business still has to look good to qualify and for the lender to go all in. So a question we usually get asked all around is, how can I qualify my business for an SBA loan? So first to pre-qualify your business, I always say that there's great value in getting an SBA pre-qualification letter. So this usually is gonna be some um, more work on the seller side of things. So normally a seller would maybe reach out to a bank or two to see if, well one, will they even put a letter together? And two, if they do that, then what type of items are needed? And I can tell you what are need, what's needed. No. Even maybe, okay. So lenders will wanna see financial information and as always, tax returns are the hot ticket items. Um, if for any reason tax returns aren't available, lenders might be willing to accept very detailed profit and loss statements, balance sheets, or really any other financial documentation you can provide. Now, it's also important to note that getting a pre-qualification letter for your business doesn't automatically mean that once you have a buyer, things are approved and done. It just doesn't work that way. But what it does mean is that 
um, once you have a great buyer in hand and a pre-qualification letter, um, it does increase the chances of selling your business and it also can help speed up the process along as well. Now if, ever, now, um, now if you want to go the extra mile, it doesn't hurt to get a certified appraisal for your business. So for the certified appraisal, this is a very useful tool for sellers because it helps you get a better understanding of what your business is worth and you can set your sale price from there. Um, it also gives you solid information um, as to how you got to that number if asked by potential buyers and also lenders. I will say for the SBA process itself, any SBA lender out there will order an appraisal of their own from a vendor or appraiser that they've worked with in the past. And that's purely an SBA requirement um, for the bank. And this is again if the seller has um, gotten a report of their own or not. With that being said, if the seller already has an appraisal of their own, the lender will still review and take it into consideration. And again, that itself can help the process go along a bit quicker because now the bank can see that the sale price that the seller has placed is on par with what the valuation is showing. Um, a couple other common questions I want to go over that's asked. So one, what is a typical deal structure? Well, for business acquisitions, again, as previously mentioned, average equity injection requirement from a borrower, we're looking at 20%. A uh, $5 million loan, that's where the cap is. Um, we're, uh, SBA loan is about a 10-year term loan. Interest rate, we're looking at prime plus 2.75, so that's really more for the buyers. Um, and it's really hard to say what the standard dip, uh, deal structure is. There's really no cookie cutter mold because the type of business you're selling, the, the buyer, the seller, all those factors can make different outcomes. So there will be variances to every structure that's out there, but this is a very standard starting point. Next, what are other important criteria to get a loan approved? Um, the list I'm about to go over isn't really the full list, but it's the most common ones that pop up and something that all lenders are going to view. So first, access to financial information on the business. As you'll notice, I, um, I bolded the tax returns line because tax returns are key. I cannot emphasize this enough. Having this in place is always going to be beneficial. It brings um, credibility, to, credibility to you as a seller, and it's something that um, lenders can easily look off of. Uh, again, I also want to emphasize how important this is because it's a government loan requirement. I cannot believe how many clients and sellers still try to argue with me to get themselves out of providing financial information. For lenders, whether it's SBA or not, no one's gonna go in blind to approve a loan for a million dollars without seeing how the business itself is doing. The business must have adequate cash flow year over year, um, and and uh, show no signs of significant loss. That's pretty much a given. Um, for the buyers, satisfactory credit scores and histories. And next. Hmm. All right, well, I'll just move forward. Um, next, which might be, again, one of the most important ones, but not ones that people think of. No recent bankruptcies, misdemeanors, or felonies on the buyer side. Um, and notice I said no recent record. So SBA loans have been approved for borrowers that have had these in the past. Um, and from personal experience, I've also had clients who've had these and we've gotten them approved. But I will say the length of time as to when all this happened is going to be pretty important. There's really no magical number per se, but from a lot of feedback I've gotten from banks, I would say typically if you have something like this in your past record, if it happened maybe seven or more years ago and your history shows that you bounced back from that, the lenders are still willing to work with you. Um, it still does create some obstacles, but the path is still open. Now, um, as far as the felonies go, not only is length of time important, but the type of felony is also gonna be crucial. So I would say for me, the, mo um, the most common type of felony I encounter from my clients is they have a DUI several years ago, 
They were young, made a mistake, but they showed proof that they did their time, did their fines, and have had a clean record since. Um, I've also had clients have had, um, that had a DUI within the past one to three years, and they've been automatically declined. So again, length of time is key. Um, now to move forward to an example to a type of felony that doesn't sit well with any lender out there, I just want to share a quick story. So about a year ago, I was introduced to a client where he and his girlfriend were wanting to buy an existing business. I will say from our initial conversation, I could tell he was already hiding something, and then finally came the question of, have you ever been charged with misdemeanor or felony? Um, he very casually said he had a run-in with the law a few years ago, um, but that it was not a big deal and now everything has been taken care of. Admittedly, that raised red flags, but I chose to continue with the conversation. Um, so after collecting more information, I reached out to a couple of our lender contacts to see if there was really any viability in this deal. I got the fastest turnaround time from my lenders, and they simply told me, one, business is underperforming anyway, so it just wasn't a fit, but every lender also highly recommended I Google this client's name. Never got that response before, so of course I did. And sure enough, guess what I found? Multiple articles and news video clips of this client being a ringleader of a Ponzi scheme that robbed, million, oh, that robbed many retirees of millions of dollars. So needless to say, that deal died right there and then. How this got through to the point where this person talked to me, I do not know, but luckily it was able to stop right there. Um, and telling this client as to why guidance and lenders could no longer assist was interesting and entertaining as well. As I was going over my talk path with this client, he at one point told me that, um, you know, you can't believe everything you read on the internet. <laughs> and I, pulled, I just politely responded and said, you can't believe everything a criminal, a criminal mastermind says. Just kidding. I wish I could say that, I was professional, don't worry. <laughs> but overall, it's really just um, letting you, know, you guys know that that type of stuff, criminal record, um, or cr let me rephrase, financial crimes, no go. Um, so with all that being said, you know, I wish I could go into more. That really is the whole process, um, the SBA rules in a nutshell, um, all in all, SBA loans, they're a very, very powerful tool for buyers and sellers. One, it helps the buyers um, achieve their dreams of business, business ownership, but also for sellers, it helps you know, them move forward into the next phase of their life after business ownership, whatever it might be. So um, you know, I hope this quick SBA spiel uh, uh, serves you well moving forward. I'm here for more questions down the road, and so I'll get there. And if you, you know, if anyone does have more questions or curiosities we don't get to, feel free to connect with us. I'm there to answer any more questions, maybe share more fun stories. You have no idea what type of interesting stuff we run into, and we'll hope to get you connected with the right person at Guidant. Thank you.